So, Peter, before we get to your latest column, I first want to ask you briefly about the Israel-Hamas war, because things have taken a sharp turn in Gaza over the last few days. So can you tell us what happened on Monday night? That was when the uh, what was essentially um, an attempt to conduct um, a softening up through air, air warfare turned into the beginning of a systematic ground offensive. It's still very tentative, uh, but that phase is now underway. And people keep wondering why it's so slow and so tentative. It's more than three weeks now since Hamas first uh, murdered um, all the civilians um, in Israel. But the reason is that all of this, this was created and designed by Hamas as a trap for Israel, uh, for which Hamas has been preparing for years. Um, they've got, uh, according to Hamas, they said a couple of years ago they built 500 kilometers of tunnel under Gaza. So, uh, and some estimates, independent estimates, think that that's probably not too far off the truth. So you've got hundreds of kilometers of tunnel uh, prepared, waiting a trap for Israel. Uh, Hamas obviously triggered the timing of the whole thing, knowing this would be the Israeli response. So Israel's going in very carefully, uh, trying not to kill hostages. In fact, they've just managed to uh, release free the first hostage after Hamas allowed four to, to leave. Uh, and th it's still in an exploratory phase. We are, we are beginning to get, I think from the, just the last 24, 48 hours, we're beginning to get a, an idea of the shape of the of how Israel is intending to proceed. It looks like they're um, planning to isolate Gaza City. They're moving in and uh, it looks like they're going to position to surround it. That looks like they've decided that is the place in which they're going to concentrate um, their efforts. Uh, briefly, um, in the last little while, they blocked uh, two tanks and a bulldozer, blocked uh, the Salah al Din Road, which is the main north-south artery through Gaza, so they were blocking, I totally isolating Gaza City. Mm. After a brief time, they opened that again. But it, it is shaping to be the encirclement, siege, and destruction of, uh, of Hamas within Gaza City. Okay, and notably, though, in the United States, conflict in the Middle East isn't the only focus, because Anthony Albanese, the Australian Prime Minister, was just in Washington visiting with Joe Biden. And you've just written that Australian foreign policy is actually a chief concern and interest for the U.S., and that this is really notable, given that Australian foreign policy used to be laughably irrelevant. So can you explain to us what's going on here? Uh, well, I relied on a quote from Henry Kissinger from the 1990s, where he memorably uh, tried to put Australia in its place by saying, when I'm shaving in the morning, I am not thinking about Australian foreign policy, which no doubt was true, but it's also quite a comical way of putting uh, Australia uh, into its place. What we saw this week, so um, Kurt Campbell, who's the president's Indo-Pacific coordinator, uh, whom I interviewed, said, well, th this, this last week, he said uh, people in Washington were thinking about Australian foreign policy while they were shaving, brushing their teeth, combing their hair and putting their ties on. Uh, Australia was um, quite relevant. Albanese was visiting Washington, so that helps explain it. But the bigger question is, why was that visit going ahead at all when you have uh, a White House occupied with two international crises, uh, trying to help Ukraine through its Russia crisis, trying to help Israel and the Palestinians, it should be said as well, uh, through their, their crises, uh, domestically, they were trying to, the American Congress, the House was trying to find itself a new speaker. Uh, plus, there's always uh, shenanigans going on with Donald Trump. And yet, with all that, in earlier times, they would simply have cancelled an Australian prime ministerial visit. Too hard, come try again next year or something. But they went ahead with a three day uh, state visit where uh, Biden personally spent about 10 hours face to face, uh, cumulatively over those three days, with Anthony Albanese. Uh, and they did the, all the bells and whistles, only the fourth state visit that Biden has hosted as president in Washington. So um, they were really making a point. They were going all out, the Americans, to make a point about the value of Australia and Albanese, who just happens to be the prime minister. And so what was the focus of this? Why? Why did this still go ahead? 
Well, the, re- the underlying reason is uh, not so much to flatter Australia or a personal tribute to Albanese, although apparently he and Biden get along pretty well. Uh, it's because of China. This is all about the macro um, or maybe the meta contest of our time and and presumably for some decades to come. As Joe Biden has put it, uh, we, America, he said, are in a fight, sorry, in a competition with China to win the 21st century. There's no bigger stakes, right? Um, and in that effort, Australia is a useful ally and asset. It extends America's reach and magnifies uh, American power. So that's why Australia is valuable at this particular moment and getting a lot more attention and priority than it would have um, at any any other time in recent decades. So can you tell us a little bit about Kurt Campbell? Because he is in a particularly good position to witness what he says is an, a relationship that's ascended to a new level between Joe Biden and Anthony Albanese. So can you sort of tell us a bit about that? About Kurt or about the relationship? Both. Okay, well, Kurt's... Uh, Michael Fullylove from the Lowy Institute calls him Mr. Australia, Kurt Campbell, within, uh, within Washington politics. He call, also calls him Australia's best friend in Washington. Kurt's been around for a long time. Uh, he's a serious policy wonk. He uh, trained uh, in the Cold War and learned Russian. He's a fluent Russian Russian speaker, as well as plays the flute, actually, which is unexpected for a big, burly um, American guy. But uh, he, so he learned Russian, found it to be uh, no longer terribly useful when after the Cold War. But then he mastered China policy. He was in the Pentagon uh, as a senior policy official for the first Clinton uh, Bill Clinton administration. Then in the State Department for Hillary Clinton, he was uh, a leading force in crafting a new China policy. He set up his own um, consultancy in Washington um, and uh, now finds himself as the uh, Indo-Pacific coordinator for the White House, for Biden. On the American side, he was the key driver in creating AUKUS. He took the Morrison, Scott Morrison idea drove it hard within the American system uh, and with the Brits to bring it to fruition. So he's a real can-do sort of operator. And the most recent reports um, uh, say that the president is going to nominate him to be the new deputy secretary of state uh, in the US. So a couple questions on that, because, well, for one thing, if he does get nominated to be the deputy secretary of state in the US, what impact could that have for Australia? because my understanding is Kurt Campbell is sort of instrumental in the Biden administration in taking a hard line on China. So can you tell us a bit about that, especially in light of the fact that Kurt Campbell made comments in Washington in June this year saying that he had previously been concerned that Australia was drifting into China's orbit. That was no longer his concern at the time, but Mm. some commentators interpreted that as suggesting that it might reveal that actually there is still some anxiety among some US officials that such a drift Mm. might reoccur. One important uh, fact I left out about uh, Kurt, Kurt Campbell and the, the whole Washington uh, uh, power milieu is that he's the other half of a, a well power couple. His wife, Lael um, Brainard, is a governor of the Federal Reserve. So between the two of them, they've got foreign policy and economic policy pretty much uh, uh, in hand. So Kurt, I don't know if you'd call him hard line, but he's certainly been driving China as the overarching priority for the US uh, for for some years. He's certainly been driving an effort to bring the US and its allies to concentrate on China. Uh, intellectually, uh, he he has been really important. A couple of key concepts. One is, as he's, he said to me directly in the past several times, we, America, can no longer do this alone. Um, the relative decline of American power, this is just a very realistic assessment uh, by Kurt and therefore ultimately by the administration. American power relatively has decreased. We need to bring our allies in. We might have thought of them as an optional extra in the past, but they're now essential. Australia is one of them. Um, Japan, South Korea, and so on. NATO, of course. Um, uh, so th- that's, that's, that's a big Rubicon for Americans to cross, to accept that as a reality. Uh, but he has brought their system to accept that reality and to craft strategy accordingly, hence the priority on Australia and allies. Um, another big conceptual um, uh, step that he, where he dragged American policy is this, to think of China not as a problem that's going to be solved 
any day, but uh, as a problem that is going to be need to be managed, a competition that has to be managed for a very long time. So not to not to be able to just pay attention to it for a short while, put in place a plan that they think is going to fix it, but to expect, anticipate, and plan for decades of competition. So which changes the whole way that policy is made. So he's been really uh, central uh, to American thinking in that way. And now I've forgotten the other part of your question. Well, do you think, is there anything to suggest that maybe even Joe Biden's reassurance during Albanese's visit to Washington that the alliance is so strong and Kurt Campbell is saying, oh, there's an enhancement of the relationship, it's stronger than ever. Is there anything to suggest that perhaps that's been happening because there is some fear in the United States or even in the Biden administration that Australia is, you know, could drift towards China again? Well, I think that earlier anxiety about Australia's position in the world has passed. Uh, once Australia stood up to China over the last few years, when China brought on the, the coercion effort big time and tried to break Australian sovereignty and has demonstrably failed, and we now see China as the supplicant state asking, you know, let's please play nice again. So that phase has passed. But there is a concern, and Kurt Campbell, in the interview I did with him, made this point, uh, and it's held uh, more broadly in the system in the US. Is Australia acting fast enough and hard enough to enact AUKUS? Is Australia acting fast enough and hard enough to implement its own defence strategic review that the uh, Albanese government brought down a few months ago? There's still questions. Uh, because we, are, we America, being so reassuring, does, is, it, is this given Australians licence to slack off? Uh, you guys really need to, to remain focused on delivery, and, and that is a continuing anxiety. But they have that about all their allies, and guess what? Their allies have that about America too. And is there just one more, I guess, question on that point about how reassured America perhaps need to be that we are still as committed mm. uh, in our alliance with them as, as we have been traditionally. I'm just wondering, do you think that Biden has made these reassurances and all of this show of strength with Australia during Anthony Albanese's visit to Washington? Does it have anything to do with the reservations that do exist in some quarters here that perhaps our strategic alliance with the United States makes us less safe because perhaps it could make us more of a target of China's? So uh, you're maybe thinking about uh, the recent book by Sam Rogovine of the Lowy Institute, The Echidna Strategy, which essentially mm. says we should roll up like an echidna with lots of prickles and make ourselves hard to yes. attack, but otherwise forget about the Americans and generally uh, try to go it alone. Um, so there's two points. One is that, uh, yeah, essentially that is um, seen as defeatist or even a, 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 an appeasement by most of the Australian political system. It's a, it's an outlier. It's, it's a good idea that... Um, we have these debates and ideas are, con are contested, and Sam's done the country a favour with that book by making us think things through. But essentially, his strategy is, let's tiptoe really quietly so we don't upset the Chinese dragon, we don't want to mm. provoke them. Well, we've just seen what happens when you tiptoe. They try to break you, and when you stand up, uh, they respect that, and you assert some agency and some power, and they respect that. They recognise. And with trying to break with with trying to break you, you're referring there to all of the the coercive the, policies, yeah, right, like the tariffs on our barley and our wine. So Is that it was the punitive trade bans. It right. was the freeze on all political contact. But it was also, don't forget, uh, at the periphery of the Australian military operations, it was a harassment, dangerous harassment of Australian aircraft, a RAF plane over international uh, airspace, and. Uh, the Australian Navy also in in uh, territorial waters of Australia. So uh, th th this was a multi-aspect uh, harassment and coercion of Australia. It failed. The second point I'd make is, although that debate is real and it has some powerful um, uh, advocates and, and sympathisers, Paul Keating is the leading one. Bob Carr is the is his sort of sidekick in mm -hmm. making that case. That is way outside the political mainstream. And the Americans know, just as we know, that the two main political parties in Australia are strongly committed uh, to the alliance and to AUKUS. So I think that's, um, that's very much a, a, a sort of marginal uh, parlor game, really, that Australian commentary and media can play. OK. And the timing of Anthony Albanese's recent visit to Washington is quite interesting, given that Biden also hosted intensive discussions with Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi. So can you tell me a bit about that, I guess, how Biden had to balance mm. both reassuring Australia that, no, we are a very active partner in the Pacific, we are very committed to this region, while also, I guess, managing 
the relationship with China there. Yeah, and we know that Australia is very much on China's mind. Not only was Xi Jinping uh, inviting, practically begging Albanese, been trying to get him to commit for months to a visit to Beijing, but but Biden let slip during the Albanese visit, uh, standing next to Albanese. Biden said last week, um, Xi Jinping asked me, why are you putting in so much effort with the Australians? It's obviously been a question on the Chinese leadership's mind. To which Biden said what pretty much what you just said, which is because he said to Xi Jinping, we're a Pacific nation and we're always going to remain one. Therefore, we operate with countries in the Pacific. Um, last week. Wang Yi was in Washington, the Chinese foreign minister, um, because the Americans have had uh, an even more um, fractious relationship with uh, the Chinese Communist Party in recent months. Wang Yi was there to try and uh, negotiate, navigate uh, a summit meeting between Joe Biden and Xi Jinping uh, on the sidelines of the APEC summit that's happening in San Francisco in just a couple of weeks. So. Uh, while Albanese was there, actually they overlapped Albanese and Wang Yi. They didn't see each other, but they were both having intensive sessions with their American interlocutors. Wang Yi had nine hours of meetings with the Secretary of State, Anthony, Anthony Blinken, uh, and one hour with Joe Biden. While the Australian visit's going on, they've got the Israel thing going on, they've got Ukraine going on, they've got the mad stuff in the Congress going on. Um, uh, so this was, this was all happening. It, you know, it's an action central. And Wang Yi uh, apparently was able to satisfy himself and the Americans that the conditions were okay to attempt a summit between Biden and Xi Jinping. So at the same time that Xi Jinping is trying to uh, calm the situation with Australia and restore uh, the status quo ante, which of course is impossible, but in the Australian government's um, argo to stabilize the relationship, he's, he's also trying to do the same with the US, which is quite interesting. And it wasn't just reassurances um, that Joe Biden made to Anthony Albanese about, say, AUKUS and how he's encouraging Congress to help that go through. But there was also signs of a, a sort of personal strengthening of relationships, not just between them, but also between their partners. Is that right? Well, you don't need warm personal relations between leaders, but it doesn't hurt uh, and it often assists. So there was a moment, uh, well, apparently, you know, Biden and Albanese get along, both kids from the wrong side of the tracks, both underestimated, who seem to have a lot in common, but also unexpectedly, um, because they didn't really know each other, were their partners, um, Dr. Jill Biden uh, and Albanese's partner, Jody Hayden. Uh, so what, what Kurt Campbell told me was that at the end of the dinner on the first night, just a casual dinner, the four of them, and as the dinner's winding up, um, the First Lady says to uh, Jody, um, how are you getting back to your, to your digs, which is Blair House, the official state guest house, a few hundred metres across the way from the White House. And she said, oh, it's a lovely evening. I thought we'd walk. And uh, Dr. Biden said, not in those shoes, you're not. And she was wearing high shoes and, and disappeared upstairs into the residence, came back down, gave her a pair of running shoes and said, there, that's much more comfortable for... <laughs> They're getting up and down the stairs. Not a typical White House gift, I would have thought. Um, it's not one you'd put on the mantelpiece, but yeah. <laughs> apparently it was a moment of, uh, a, of warmth that uh, made an impression. Perhaps better than having to steal an ashtray from the White House bathroom. That is a little bit on the sad side, yes. <laughs> they didn't have to resort to that. <laughs> and now we've got Anthony Albanese. He's due to land in Beijing this weekend, ahead of a visit with Xi Jinping himself. So this visit that Anthony Albanese has just had with Biden and all of their, their sort of love in, so to speak, if you want to call it that, does that make Albanese's meeting with Xi trickier than perhaps it would have otherwise been? No, I don't think so. Um, so the, that's, it would in the traditional uh, metaphor that we, Australia, have used for a long time looking at relations with China and the US, which is a balancing, right? We have to balance America and China, one's security and one's economy. Um, and it implies a sort of precariousness, and it implies an even-handedness, balancing. But I think that that metaphor is uh, redundant. I think what we've just been through showed that because uh, we, if we were balancing before the Chinese coercion, uh, we certainly abandoned that. The Australian government and opposition both said, well, if that's how you're going to be, we're going to go all in with the Americans even more than we already are. We're going to do AUKUS. We're way up there with the Quad. Um, we're going to defy you in every possible way. So really what Australia has done has uh, uh, 
increased its position of strength and is now dealing with China from a position of strength, not uh, one of trying to balance, but really one where it has a, uh, I've got to think of a better metaphor for, for this, but it, it's standing on, on a solid ground supported by the US and other allies. And remember, it's been improving and increasing its relations with Japan, with India, with the Pacific, with a whole bunch of countries to create a position of strength with which to deal to China. So the balance, if it ever applied, does no longer. And I, so I don't think uh, that by visiting Washington, Albanese has in any way made his trip harder. In fact, according to Kurt Campbell, uh, each of the allies, the US and Australia, has given each other a boost and some confidence in their dealings with Xi Jinping in the weeks to come. Which brings me back to something you said at the beginning, which was Henry Kissinger's great quote about how once irrelevant Australian foreign policy was to the US. So does all of this, everything we've been talking about, the, you know, the, the strengthening of the alliance between the United States and Australia, does this on a broader level, I guess, shift Australia to perhaps a slightly different position on the geopolitical uh, stage more broadly? Like, are we more significant in general, I guess? And, and does it matter? Uh, well, in that, two things have happened. First, there's a general recognition now uh, that not only is China the, the, the great power in competition with the US, uh, forget Russia, R Russia is a much lower order power, and as we knew beforehand, but has been even further exposed with its failures uh, trying to invade Ukraine and, and, not, uh, and failing. So one is acceptance that that is the big contest and the big theater of, uh, of competition and geostrategy. Another is the awakening of countries that were uh, asleep to that. And essentially, we're talking about mainly the EU, but also countries uh, and, and the NATO countries, which have taken an increasingly hard line stance against uh, China and uh, its various depredations, including several of them uh, stepping up and or starting or restarting military operations and uh, exercises and patrols in the South China Sea. Uh, that includes the, the Brits, the French, the Germans. They weren't doing that. Now they are. Um, so, But it's also in the Pacific. Countries have now uh, uh, take, taken an increasingly tough line against China. Japan's announced a doubling of its military budget and so on. There's, there are myriad examples. Uh, so it's partly uh, uh, this recognition that this is the contest. And Australia, to come directly to your, your question, has stepped into that contest as a frontline state uh, doing competition with China. That is why uh, Australia has become more relevant. Partly it's because of what China's doing, but partly it's because of how Australia has responded. Thank you so much, Peter, for your time.